answer's reasonably short, but, uh, uh, and if I'll, I'll make it sound like that or something off camera, okay. if, if, you know. That's fine, so I can stand by. Okay, go. good luck. Tonight on Talkback, the smoking debate. Should smokers be entitled to the same level of medical treatment as non-smokers? Indeed, should smokers have any rights at all? Good evening, I'm Frank Partridge and welcome to Monday's Talkback and welcome to my guest Chris Tame of the pro-smoking lobby Forest. Now Chris is uh, pro-smoking but not, as Laurie Mayer suggested, a smoker himself. Now it's being claimed today that the NHS is discriminating against smokers. Campaigners claim that some people are being denied proper treatment because they choose to smoke. It's a multifaceted moral maze and it raises several questions. Among them, should doctors have the right to make medical decisions on moral grounds? Should smokers accept that they're risking their health and their lives voluntarily and should be prepared to take the consequences? And there's also the question of the dangers of passive smoking and the rights, or otherwise, of the smoker in public places. Harry Elphick was a smoker. He'd had a heart attack. He was refused preliminary tests for heart surgery because he continued to smoke. He died three days before his new appointment after he'd given up smoking. And because he wanted that life, you know, that kind of lifestyle, he just got kicked in his teeth and that's it. They never give my husband a chance. They never even see my husband. Harry Elphick's case has ignited the tinderbox debate on smoking. On the one hand, it could be an example of doctors using their medical knowledge to pass moral judgment. On the other, it's an example of a smoker who's accepted the consequences of his habit. But, you know, when you're smoking, you're endangering your health anyway, so why should you be, <laughs> why should you be helped to live longer? Well, there's other things killing you as well or not. Too much sex, too much overeating, like. <laughs> I mean, the NHS would disappear if their revenue from smoking was, was cut off. That's why they're so happy to keep it going. The health department says it's up to doctors how and when they treat their patients. Labour says the case illustrates the stupidity of a government that refuses to ban tobacco advertising and also points out that the Elphick case highlights a lack of resources in the health service, forcing doctors to pick and choose. Today also marks the start of European Cancer Week, a major offensive against passive smoking. Anti-smoking groups claim as many as 4,000 lung cancer deaths in the EC each year could be due to passive smoking. They want a right to smoke-free air. I actually gave up for quite a long time once and I found myself more aware of smoke in the atmosphere and social environments when I didn't smoke. I found it very uncomfortable. They're dirty, filthy creatures. <laughs> I can say that now. People that smoke are silly, but it's difficult to make them change their mind, isn't it? Smokers again say they have rights. Government figures on tobacco revenue back their case. In the last financial year, Taxes on tobacco products provided £6.29 billion for the nation's coffers. That's come from a 76% tax levy on a pack of cigarettes. So for every packet of 20 sold for £2.20, £1.67 goes to the government. And official figures also show that smokers are being more heavily penalised now than they used to be. Ten years ago, the number of cigarettes released for sale in Britain was 99,342 million compared to last year's 93,573 million. So, smokers argue that they pay their way for a right to smoke. Anti-smokers claim they have rights too, to breathe in clean air. The debate goes on. Well, what do you think? Now, here are the numbers to ring if you've got a point to put on this subject or you want to put a question to Chris Tame of the pro-smoking campaign group uh, Forest. Uh, 0891 555595, that's 0891 555595, that's UK callers. Outside Britain, dial your <coughs> international access number first, and then 4471 757 7095. International code, then 4471 757 7095 to put your calls to Chris Tame from the Smokers Action Group Forest. Um, Chris, before we hear the first callers, the uh, Elphick case in Manchester was very high profile. Um, the hospital received a fair amount of flack for apparently uh, denying him medical treatment until he stopped smoking. 
Um, but is this widespread or is it just uh, one, the exception that proves the rule? Well, we know of 10 definite recorded cases, two of which came to light actually just this last Friday. Uh, but I think this is actually uh, the tip of an iceberg. And we know that Withenshaw Hospital, the hospital that refused Mr. Elphick treatment, uh, has been practicing a policy of discrimination against smokers for over 10 years now. And it was only in the Elphick case that it really uh, came to light. So we're very worried about it. The NHS, we all know, is overstretched, <coughs> doesn't have enough money. There are queues for hospital beds. Isn't it fair that doctors uh, devise some form of pecking order to uh, enable those most deserving to get those beds first? I think not. I think that principle of discrimination is just simply against the spirit of the NHS, which is supposed to guarantee treatment according to the basis of clinical need. Uh, and where do we draw the line? I mean, why should smokers be discriminated against? I mean, uh, gay people are very unpopular with some people. Should they be discriminated against? What about heterosexuals with VD? What about alcoholics? There's as much dietary-related illness in the country and indeed, the NHS actually spends more on treating uh, sporting-related injuries than it does on smoking-related illnesses. So, you know, it's an issue of where we draw the line. Okay, but the NHS also spends a lot of money uh, with health education campaigns telling people not to smoke. And then people go and ignore their advice, get ill in some cases because of smoking, and then knock on the door and expect treatment. Is that fair? Um, I think it is, yes, because the, after all, the NHS isn't free. <laughs> We're paying for it all the time. They're always telling us it's our NHS. And the NHS there is there to serve us, not to be our master. Now, people may well be foolish for, for not going jogging every day or for not giving up smoking or for not drinking less or not becoming vegetarians, whatever. Um, the issue is it's, all very, so it's okay for doctors to give their advice. It's okay for the HEA, presumably, to give its advice. Um, but in the end, it's a matter of individual freedom. You know, it's, it's, you know, do we want to live in a nanny state where we're told what to do, we're made what to do, or in the end, is, is freedom our birthright? Okay, we'll hear from you a little bit later. Let's hear now from our first caller of the evening, uh, Brendan Keenan uh, from County Tyrone in uh, Northern Ireland. Uh, Brendan, I'm told uh, that you've started smoking very young and uh, that now you're not very well. Yes, that's right. T tell us about it. Well, uh, I told him the smoking that... Uh uh, left me not well. It was uh, rheumatic fever. But uh, I was told by a doctor in uh, the city hospital in Belfast, until I would uh, give up smoking, there's no way they would have an, uh, call me in for an operation. So you're one of the victims uh, that Chris was talking about. Yeah. Um, um, and and what, what did you feel about it? Did you feel, well, I'll give up smoking then because uh, that may have contributed to my ill health? No. No, it didn't contribute to my ill health. Uh, it was rheumatic fever that uh, contributed to my ill health. I was a smoker up until 18 years. When I was 18 years of age, they found out that uh, I had uh, mitral valve disease. So uh, I was smoking long before that, and uh, I'm still smoking yet. I'm trying to give it up, the same as everybody else. Nobody wants to smoke. But right. uh, the problem is I've, uh, they don't treat smokers. What are they going to do with people injecting themselves with uh, uh, drugs, dirty needles? And they do treat them? They do treat them, yes. Yeah. Okay, Chris, is this, uh, does this surprise you? Here's a, well, a hospital in County Tyrone. Did you know about it? I didn't know about that case, and in fact, uh, I didn't catch the gentleman's name, but if in fact he'd like to get in touch with Forrest, we're in directory inquiries, we're in central London, uh, we'd like to hear from him because we are gathering information about this. Um, there are legal inquiries going on at the moment, so we would like to, would like to hear from you. So please do get in, call, in touch with us, caller. Okay, Brendan, thanks very much. You'll pick up the number uh, later, I think. Now, Bradley Cobb is our second caller, all the way from uh, Marbella. Uh, in Spain. Hello, Bradley. Hi, can you hear what, me okay? Yes, we can. W what have you got to tell us? Well, I, I used to work in a hospital in West Yorkshire um, for about 17 years in the uh, biochemistry department. I used to do blood tests on people to check to see if they had stopped smoking because there was a policy with one or two of the surgeons um, whereas they uh, refused operations which would alleviate problems caused by narrowing of the arteries which was directly caused by smoking which um, I'm totally in agreement with because you've got people on the waiting list if you have limited resources in the NHS the people who are trying their best to um, uh, become healthy again because of an operation where which is brought on by not related with smoking or they've stopped smoking uh, quite a time before the operation and don't continue to smoke. I think they deserve precedence. I mean, if you want to go private and pay for yourself, fair enough. I think there should be the facilities, but I don't think the NHS should pick up the tab 
for the smoking-related diseases. I mean, they say 6.2 billion raised in taxes. It doesn't say, I suppose it's impossible to calculate what expenses incurred by the NHS because of cigarette-related diseases. All right. Uh, Bradley, we'll come to that point in a moment because our next caller, uh, John Bertwistle of Doncaster, is also, uh, I gather, anti-smoking. Good evening, John. Uh, good evening. How anti-smoking are you? And do you believe that uh, smokers should be discriminated against? Well, I think they should have their own department in restaurants and in public places. I think that it's uh, terrible to go out and have a lovely meal in a restaurant. We was in, 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 in an Indian restaurant in Bawtry last night. There were four ladies smoking near us. And they overtook our meal. I mean, Indian food is very tasty, but they took the whole atmosphere over <coughs> of the evening. And I think that's very bad, very bad for the paying people. And surely the smokers should have a room on their own um, so that we can enjoy our food and they can enjoy their cigarettes if they have to, and the food as well. All right, John, uh, it's uncomfortable as a non-smoker being in the same room as uh, four smokers sitting at the same table. Uh, do you believe that it's harmful to health? Because many people do believe uh, that passing sp uh, passive smoking can cause serious illness and indeed death. Well, I certainly do. I mean, I'm in farming. I got into a tractor cab the other day where one of my men had been smoking cigars and I took him off for his lunch uh, and his atmosphere in the cab was absolutely terrible. If I had asked that man to work in a condition like that on any, in any business, he would refuse. And yet, he puts it, pulls a cigarette, cigarette smoke or cigar smoke down into his lungs, and how long is it before he, he, he's clear, uh, having clear air? Right, okay, John, thanks a lot for that point. Uh, Chris Dame, if I can come to you. Um, there is a, a growing lobby uh, that believes passive smoking apart from being antisocial, uh, is also downright dangerous. Uh, well, firstly, clearly, let's admit that smoking can be annoying to non-smokers. And obviously, we in Forex have got nothing against reasonable compromises, reasonable smoking policies, smoking and no-smoking zones in restaurants. And indeed, if an entrepreneur wishes to have an entirely no-smoking restaurant, then that's up to him to respond to consumer demand as he sees fit. You know, so let's have this, a bit of take. This estimate but I mentioned, uh, uh, um, it's estimated that 4,000 people die from lung cancer as a result of passive smoking in the EC every year. Complete and utter baloney. Um, this has been a very successful propaganda campaign by the anti-smoking lobby, but if you actually look at the scientific evidence, and I challenge anyone out there to go and look at the original stuff, you'll find that the great bulk of research into this subject does not say that smoking causes, uh, sorry, passive smoking causes uh, problems for non-smokers. Um, the bulk of the evidence is quite clear. It produces either no result, or indeed in some, some cases, results that seem to indicate that it's beneficial to the non-smoker. So this is just scientific propaganda. Okay, well you can say that, but on the other hand, people might say that you're issuing <coughs> propaganda but saying passive smoking isn't dangerous. Well, isn't it the onus so on you? to prove that passing sp uh, passive smoking is not dangerous? Well, no. In, in science, the onus is upon someone who puts forward a thesis to prove their thesis. And the fact is that the proponents of the passive smoking view hasn't. The bulk of scientific evidence, and this is not evidence produced by us or reports commissioned by us or reports commissioned by the tobacco industry, it's the scientific investigation into this issue, in fact, does not establish that there's any threat from passive smoking. And I just say to people, don't take my word for that. Look at our literature. Look at the literature of our opponents. Go and look at the original scientific evidence. All right. Um, thanks a lot, Chris. We'll come back to you in a moment. Uh, the next caller is uh, Jim Cranfield from uh, Ammonford. Jim, good evening. Good evening. What's your contribution to this debate? Well, I would like to say that I, I, I do, I am, I am a smoker and that um, I honestly believe that smoking does damage your health. Um, but my point is that as a smoker, it's not illegal to smoke. The government would in no way, or the National Health would in no way refuse to treat a mugger, a child molester, or a murderer, who I consider myself to be somewhat better and I'm entitled to the benefits that the country um, provides. I also think that um, the government has known for 20 years or more that cigarettes cause problems and have done nothing but rake in the money from taxes and tobacco advertising, etc., from the, the product of... Uh, with the cigarettes, you know. Okay, uh, it's agreed that they rake in the money, but a, an earlier caller wondered how much the government's having to spend um, treating people who are suffering from smoking-related illnesses. Well, I've always voted for a conservative government. But let's leave, let's leave the politics the... out of this. Pardon? Let's leave the politics out of it. Conservative and Labour governments alike have taxed smokers heavily and taken the advantages thereof. That's exactly what I was going to say. Sorry. I've always voted for this government. Um, but having seen what they've done with everything else, I can assure you if they weren't making money out of it, they'd have already stopped it. 
All right. Uh, thanks, thanks a lot for that call. Um, we'll press on because we've got a big queue waiting. Uh, let's now go to uh, Sussex, I think. Crowborough. Trevor Dudley is our next caller. Good evening, Trevor. Yeah, good evening. What have you got to say? Well, basically, what I've got to say is I think uh, what was being said before regarding the um, atmosphere, um, the, I can't remember the guy's name at Forest, but uh, I, I've got a point of view that I think is very strong with, regarding... Pete, I don't like to smoke in a restaurant because I don't like smoke over my food, but I'm a smoker, so we try and restrict that. Um, we pay a, I pay a lot of money into the National Health uh, and now I'm hearing that uh, if I smoke, I maybe not be treated. And I, I, I tend to wonder w w what the world is coming to when you're paying all this money and you have a choice. Are we now saying that basically, uh, on, if, if I was to be able to say I don't pay national health anymore, um, is, is that fair? So I don't contribute to the national health. Uh, that was the first point. The second well, point just is on that first point, uh, uh, some people might say you have been warned. Um, you are a smoker, you know the risks, you might need health treatment, um, but you have been warned. Yeah, well, we, get, we also get warned on uh, Coca-Cola, for example. Uh, it's a widely known fact, I believe, that Coca-Cola is known to cause cancer. Uh, I don't know if that's widely known. Um, and certainly nobody warns you to the same extent that they write on a pack, smoking kills. Uh, they do in the United States, in New York. If you buy, if you buy a bottle of Coca-Cola on the actual Coke, it actually has a, like a government health warning. Well, we'll have to put a disclaimer on that uh, because I'm not, I'm not sure that um, we would go along with that. Uh, uh, I, it's said in the past that perhaps it has um, a damaging effect on teeth, but I don't know if it causes cancer. Anyway, thanks for that point. Let's move on uh, to Menorca, um, off the coast of uh, Spain. Terry Brown's our caller this evening from there. Terry, good evening. Yeah, good evening. Yeah, this is um, to both of you there and all the surgeons that may be li listening, that work in the, in the private sector and the national health. Um, in the last four years, I, I've been back to England in a private clinic and had two operations, a uh, triple bypass uh, 18 months ago, prior to that, uh, aorta uh, graft. They accepted my money without, um, they knew I was a very heavy smoker. Wait a minute, you, you're, you went private. Uh, no, was I went this, private. Was this in, in, in Menorca or Spain or Britain? Uh, in, in England, right. um, in London, just off um, Marble Arch. Um, right. You went to a private hospital, they yes, accepted your money. But no, um, what I'm saying is the surgeons there that done my operation also operate uh, under the National Health. And um, there's no, there's, there's a world apart, they're a world apart. Um, I was smoking in, the, in my private room. Um, 40, 50 cigarettes a day. And they knew I was a very heavy smoker. They took my five and a half grand for my first operation, and they took nine and a half grand off me for the second operation. And they were saying, what a very good patient you are, Mr. Bailey. Thank you very much. Um, and Come back again sometime. Listen, mate, um, they're, they're so, well, I, I get so angry because National Health, they, they go from private to um, uh, National Health, and they're two different doctors. Right, okay. Um, uh, thanks for making that point. Chris, do you, do you um, detect double standards within the medical profession? Well, I do. In fact, we had a telephone call at Forest, actually, shortly after the, the Elphick case uh, from a doctor who wished to remain anonymous at that hospital, uh, saying we ought to look into uh, um, whether the same surgeons who refused to treat people on the NHS took slightly the same arrogant view towards their private patients. And I think this the caller bears this out. I wonder if I could come back to one earlier point, because it's mm -hmm. quite an important point of fact. Uh, Bradley, I think it was earlier on, uh, asked what the cost of the National Health Service was of treating smoking-related diseases. Well, we do have a figure for that, and it's from the Health Education Authority itself, not known for its pro-smoking views, and it's about £437 million pounds per annum. And that compares with how much that smokers pay in tax? About, well, I think the figures your programme gave earlier on were actually slightly out of date. I think it's up to about £8 billion pounds per annum now. Um, so uh, it's, a, it's about two-thirds of the running cost of the NHS. Uh, and that's just the, the actual revenues from tobacco itself, and that's not including income tax on people who work within the industry and a lot of other ancillary industries. So, right. And again, the, the figures for treating sporting-related injuries is 500, I think it's 590 million pounds per annum. 
So, I mean, we could go on. There's so many other areas, alcohol, you know, driving accidents. You know, I say, you know, it's a, a general principle we're dealing with here. If we discriminate against smokers, then why not against other people who live risky lives? Okay, Chris, thanks for a moment. Let me remind you, tonight on TalkBack, we're discussing smoking, smokers, and smokers' rights. Uh, here are the numbers to ring if you haven't written them down. 0891 in the UK, or from outside Britain, First, your international access code, followed by 4471 757 7095 to make a general point or put a point to uh, Chris Tame of the pro-smoking lobby, Forrest. Now, someone who's done that, uh, rung us, is Helen Richards from Penzance down in Cornwall. Um, hello, Helen, what would you like to say? Hello. Um, I'm a smoker, and I have been for 37 years. Um, I've, uh, my husband, he smoked for years and years, and seven years ago he gave up smoking and he's never had a day's health since. He's got rheumatoid arthritis, he suffers with asthma, he suffers with angina, and all this, I'm sure, is due to giving up smoking. Um, I say that, I mean, they treat drug addicts, they treat alcoholics, they've got gambling clinics, they've got sexual transmitted diseases clinics. The government have even got now that a woman should work till they're 65 to save on pensions. Um, they also treat murderers and child abusers, as long as he or she is, isn't a smoker, I take it. Okay. Um, another point is, I mean, um, they say how much it costs for a smokers on the National House, but how much does it cost to keep a murderer in prison? Uh, interesting parallel, um, but uh, thanks for making it, and, uh, and also the, the general appeal on behalf of smokers that they're unfairly discriminated against. Uh, back to London, Lloyd Suspedes uh, is the caller. Lloyd, good evening. Good evening there. Yes, my name is Lloyd. I've just called through to speak considering um, what's been said by uh, Chris about all this smoking lot. Now, I used to smoke uh, years ago. This was in, back in the early years, at the age of 12 and I contracted uh, bronchitis. Now, when I went to the doctors to get treated, he told me I had to give up smoking or else it would be you know, detrimental to my health. So I said to him, well, I couldn't do it because I've been smoking for so long. I just, don't, you know, I just haven't got the within me to pack it up. How long ago was that? This was in uh, the early 70s. Uh, but he didn't, he didn't refuse to treat you. He just said it, uh, it would be advisable to give up. No, he didn't refuse to treat me. He said he would give me whatever it was I needed. But I said that it, it owned, but he said to me, I need to give up smoking anyway for the help. And I said to him, well, what I'll do, I'll try. Isn't there any other alternative? So he said, we'll try herbal cigarettes or, you know, something else, the menthol stuff that they okay. have. So I took on that. But to tell you how it went, um, I, I, I just went straight back on the hard facts because there was no way I could get off of them. What do you think about these uh, current cases we've been hearing about where smokers uh, are refused medical treatment? Well, at this present time, you see, we all make a choice. We have a choice to make in our life, and every one of us has been, you know, been given a free will. And if it's a choice of one person to keep on smoking despite they've been told to give it up, then you know, they've already made their decision to, you know, to take their life. You know, okay. If it happens that they were given the treatment and they do pass away, then it would work out the same thing on the... You know, on the um, the health authorities um, side that they treated them and they died on the whatever treatment they were given them so it's like one knocking the other yep okay Lloyd um, uh, uh, supporting I think the majority view certainly uh, in the 25 minutes or so of this program so far now Philip Sutcliffe from Cardiff uh, I think has uh, uh, an original point Philip good evening yes thank you good evening first of all I don't want my words to be construed as pro-smoking or, in fact, anti-smoking. Okay. Um, Make your point, please. But uh, the point is that I think that doctors should really produce a, st a charter stating which habits or health risk-related behaviours will result in the withdrawal of which treatments and whether these may be treatable under private medical facilities. Uh, now, so, I see. So somebody would move into the private sector, but they would have to make that choice first. Well, I think I, the point I'm really making is, is that uh, if doctors are uh, occasionally refusing treatment for certain conditions or for certain uh, uh, types of treatment, uh, then they should make clear uh, to the public at large in, in Britain just precisely which uh, habits, which risk-related behaviours and which treatments uh, will be withdrawn in, in cases of presentation of, of illness. Right, interesting point. Uh, Chris, what, what would you like to say to that? Well, I mean, in a sense, yes, let's make it clear if this is what's going to happen. Let's get it out in the open. Um, 
but the principle, I think, just must not be accepted. If we're taxed you know, for this service, then it should be provided to us, and there should be no discrimination. If the government says there is going to be discrimination, then I suggest it starts giving tax credits to those who have been discriminated against, so that they can spend some of their own money, which is being taken by the NHS, on their own private treatment. But I think the principle must be rejected. It's an intolerable principle. It's a dictatorial principle, and it's totally at variance with the principles of the N NHS. All right. OK. Thanks for your call, Philip. Um, now, callers from now on, please make your point very quickly because we're running short of time. Uh, Pamela Lack, uh, ringing from Andorra. Pamela, good evening. Good evening. Your point quickly, please. Um, I'm 70 years of age and am a lifelong smoker. I was hooked years before smoking was considered to be life-threatening. Smoking is a self-inflicted addiction, I admit, and as is drug-taking and alcoholism. Drug addicts and alcoholics receive help to break their addictions and their resulting problems. So why be selective towards smokers? Okay, um, uh, let me break in there, Pamela. You've made the point uh, very clearly. Thank you for making it. Let's move back to uh, uh, UK. Gloucester is the location for the next caller. Aubrey Van Prague. Aubrey. Yes. Uh, uh, you're not a smoker, I gather. I am a completely anti-smoker. Right, where do you stand on this argument? Well, I, I can't stand people smoking next to me, and I think it's a disgusting habit. Having said What about that, smokers' rights? Do they have any rights? Uh, uh, that, exactly. Having said that, it, it is a sign of our intolerant society that people who have made the choice, as Lloyd uh, made the point earlier on, uh, should be denied uh, everybody's right, however rich or poor they are, uh, taxpayer or not taxpayer, to medical treatment. It is completely uh, outlandish, immoral and unethical. Uh, okay, Aub Aubrey, let me break in there. The let me break in there. Thank you for making that point. Our final caller, I think, we can just squeeze in Dean Price from Burton-on-Trent. Hello, yes. Uh, uh, Hello. hello, Dean. Yeah, hello. I'd like to make my point is I've been in hospital quite recently because I've been smoking because I suffer from asthma. And it says five to ten years' time I'm going to have a crippled chest. Well, I says, can I have some old Petronic break in the habit, OK? And they says, well, you know, it's just a lot of willpower. Well, I think what the National Health Service should do is, you know, the nicotine patches is yeah. uh, give them a National Health Service to help a lot of people uh, break smoking because I want to stop smoking, but I can't. You know, and I'm only 25. Within five or ten years... I'm going to get a crippled chest, you know, uh, so what do I do? OK, Dean, um, thanks for making a point. Sorry we can't develop it because we're running short of time. I'm afraid that is a uh, talk back for another day. Many thanks to our guest, Chris Tame. Sorry we had to rush you there. A lot of callers tonight, though. Uh, thanks to all of you for joining us and calling us. There'll be another talk back at the same time tomorrow evening, so do join us then if you possibly can. Thank you.